So, uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I've lost all concept of time, but uh, let's plunge in, uh, especially following uh, such a good break. Um, we've asked our individual uh, speakers here, our panelists, uh, in this order. Uh, first, Steve, and then Wailan, and, and, and so on, Mary and Peter. And then last, uh, Rustam. And they've asked me especially not to cut down their time, which is exactly eight minutes. Yeah. So, and, uh, so let's plunge in. I'm sure we would also very much like to leave some time for, for Q&A because there are some weighty issues to be, to be discussed. Yeah. So Steve, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, at La Salle, we're talking about priorities. Uh, at La Salle, we have 32, according to our KPIs, our kind of tier one KPIs. So, but I don't want to go through all of them. I'm going to go for two. And I'm just looking really at us harnessing te technology and then building global networks. So that's, that's the focus of my presentation. OK, we've been harnessing technology for decades at La Salle. We, all, we are very contemporary. We want to be always at the cutting edge. So we've been doing it uh, you know, a long time. And really, in, in terms of COVID and all the technological needs there, we felt quite ahead of the game because we'd already been using a lot of telematic uh, technologies, for example, to bring remote participants uh, to, together. We also have many um, uh, staff, many faculty, who really kind of specialize in high-tech arts, and one of them is the wonderful Yurik Lau. Uh, we have staff who create and, um, and actually uh, make, invent really innovative instruments, and this is uh, Dirk Stromberg here um, performing with one of his, his students at the Art Science Museum. Groovy. Okay, so uh, this and this next one is actually uh, a NAFA project, uh, but I'm bringing it in because uh, Dirk also did the coding and interaction design uh, on this fantastic uh, piece, uh, which is a, is a NAFA, Na, a NAFA project. This instrument, this grand instrument, has over a hundred interactive uh, sensors, and it's played here by its creator, Joyce Bitwan Co. <laughs> Meta groovy. Okay, uh, in the classroom, we are working with lots of techniques uh, and technologies, um, and here you'll see uh, some of them. Now, we always emphasize to students that technology is a bridge, not a destination. Technology is a tool and a springboard for their individual creativities, and this is really important to, to emphasize. Here you're seeing uh, work made by robotic arms, machine, um, machine drawing, and also uh, these are typographic um, elements that, that are using various software applications, but also custom coding that students uh, are, are doing to create these really innovative uh, type of typographical uh, imagery. Okay, students are working with AI uh, and also data visualizations, a couple of examples here. And again, we really emphasize to students to be bold with this, to, to be very uh, uh, original and ambitious. Uh, and one of UAS's uh, core values is courage. Uh, and we're always encouraging this in the classroom. Students are working in bio arts. This is a really kind of important uh, new field that has em emerged over the last decade. And our students are really, really working hard on this. They're also working with uh, video mapping and immersive visuals, as you can see here. Um, fashion students have created, as part of uh, a, a collaboration, an exhibition with the Asian Civilizations Museum, they've created uh, uh, fashion avatars who are working in three-dimensional environments. <laughs> And technology is also used to spur on 
interdisciplinarity. And interdisciplinarity is, is again, one of our kind of key priorities um, at, at La Salle. We have all the arts, art forms under one roof, as, as does NAFA. And this really uh, is important in, in fostering an interdisciplinary uh, practices. Now, here you're seeing uh, designers working with performing arts students. <laughs> And here, um, animation students worked with dance students, and they worked together collaboratively to create all the characters, the stories, and all the interactive elements. In the Putnam School of Film, they're working to mix realities and using uh, game engines like Unreal and, Real and so on. Now, uh, you know, a number of um, universities will be doing this, but this is very, very difficult work, and I think it's the level of sophistication uh, that we really encourage in students and the conceptualization as well as uh, just the, you know, the technical know-how. Now, one of the key sort of tasks and problems for the students is to match the lighting of the live, the live and, well, of the two realities, okay? And this is, is no easy task. We see it done brilliantly here. The animator has really got the lighting right on, on that flame and, you know, and so on to match with the backgrounds. So some really kind of spectacular work going on there. Uh, augmented reality animation students also working with augmented uh, reality. And this is for uh, a Peranakan Indian cookbook. Okay, so um, in, with the physical cookbook, you put your phone against it to read the images and all these um, AR augmented reality animations uh, appear. It's a really kind of um, a wonderful project. Also, uh, our School of, of Creative Industries has developed Hangout VR uh, stations, these, these virtual environments where students can hang out but also give and receive feedback, so quite innovative use of that. And we're using virtual reality. Here you're seeing uh, Melissa Quirk, our head of school uh, of, of dance and, and, and theatre, working uh, using virtual reality as a teaching tool with, uh, with dancers. And then also, uh, in our media lab, Andreas Schlegel has been using virtual reality to create virtual dancers. Okay, this is a live theater, theater project that, that I initiate, initiated called Virtually No Exit. Um, and it has two actors, one uh, resembling me, uh, and <laughs> uh, together with um, uh, an audience member, a single audience member who wears a VR headset, you can see here. And we take them around lots of different virtual environments. We do interactive, silly things uh, like that, and then it gets sort of darker and darker. We're in two separate green screen rooms within La Salle brought together by the magic of technology. And the twist is that they're actually in hell. <laughs> it seems like paradise, but actually it's just an arts college. Okay, I'll move from te technological innovations to um, our international um, global enga engagement. This has been very, very important for La Salle, particularly over the last 10 years, but it's, been, it's gone back for many, many years. Uh, in fact, uh, over 17 years. This is Tropical Lab. You'll see Milenko uh, Pravatsky there uh, in black perennially uh, near, near the center at, center at the front, who is the leader and the tropical king of this tropical lab. Uh, we invite ev every year around 25 postgraduate students from all uh, art schools and some of the best art schools around the globe, and they all come here for two, for two weeks. We look after them. Uh, we do seminars and field trips and so on, and then they create a wonderful exhibition. So it's really helped to help us network with all these global art schools. Um, the ANSA network was founded by uh, our provost, Dr. Venka Purushothaman, in 2012. It looks at uh, arts leadership, arts management, and cultural uh, policy, and has annual um, labs uh, and biannual conferences. Uh, there's Provost Venka uh, receiving a fellowship from Mushishinu Art University, who's what, who are one of the partners to, uh, to get together, uh, together with others like Central St. Martins in the Global Design Initiative. And here again, at least annually, students and staff together will go to one of the host, um, host cities and conduct workshops and, and sessions looking at the future of design. Yeah. The Shared Campus pro project is a, a, uh, has seven different partners, and again, we move around uh, the, the globe and the cities of the hosts 
there, including Tokyo University of Arts, University of Arts London, Zurich University of the Arts, and it's mainly student-focused. So lots of students uh, travel and uh, have fantastic ac activities that are organized by the host institution. During COVID, of, of course, this was difficult, but ever innovative, um, the, the shared campus and, and La Salle got together to do lots of tele-improvisations, and I'll show you a quick clip of one of those. Sally and Amit in Singapore. Joe and Laura in Zurich. And then we have Mike, Mike and John, Marius and Simon in draw time. So let's start. <laughs> Okay, we are, we are part of a number of associations, and one of them is ACAD. This is an association of 38 of the um, leading art schools in the United States, and we are one of very few affiliate members from outside the States to be a part of, a part of that. And also, we are uh, currently vice chair of the Asian League of Institutes of the Arts, bringing together lots of Asian arts institutions. We have an international joint program, and we have others that are top secret at the moment, but we'll, we'll be launching uh, soon. Uh, so this international um, uh, program is with three partners uh, in Europe um, and, and, and funded by Erasmus+. Plus. And um, we've also, the, uh, this, this is shot, three different projects uh, that, that are sort of long-term. Long uh, we've been collaborating with two of the leading animation schools in France and with the largest animation festival in the world, Nancy, um, for, for uh, many years, also met for many years. We've been exhibiting, or product design students have been exhibiting at the Milan Furniture Fair, one of the most prestigious furniture fairs. And we've done a recent project with OCAD. This is Canada's largest um, arts institution, uh, creating a global, globe-spanning tapestry. Oops, I'll go back. Um, we've developed, about five years ago in our BA honours curriculum, we um, established uh, the opportunity for students in their second year to take a full semester abroad, work, um, studying at another institution. And to make that happen, uh, we've developed 40 different uh, student exchange partnerships. Some are just for two or three students, some uh, offer like, we have one with Kingston for, uh, in the UK for, uh, for 32 students. So really enabling students to, to go abroad. And you can see some of the, uh, the institutions that we're partnering with them and, and, and students are you know uh, currently at and so on now uh, what's wonderful obviously there are clearly benefits for students to to go around the, around the, the globe into another another institution but also for the incoming students who come to La Salle from other institutions they really add dynamism energy and a fresh perspective to the classrooms here in La Salle we also had faculty exchanges the most uh, recent here with um, VCU arts in Qatar um, and uh, recently, this was in, in December, um, uh, Balinese performance experts from uh, Indonesian Institute of Art, Arts Denpasar came and worked with over 50 of our students over three weeks. And then, uh, then we, uh, they had public performances and street processions. Here's a little. <laughs> So these international partnerships are really reaping benefits, not least in research, and research is another big agenda that, um, that La Salle is following. Uh, this is a joint research pro project with the University of Oxford, and it's looking at, um, um, at, at sort of visualization of big data, but also looking at the storytelling aspects of, uh, of those visualizations. It automatically translates raw data into indices. It is designed to help with data intense analysis, strategic planning, and communication. We've also um, got a collaboration with the University of Brighton in the UK. This was during COVID, and it was government-funded fu government uh, in, in, in the UK, but we were the key, the key partner because of our expertise. And this was working with theatre companies to find new ways of working together during lockdown. So if you have separate actors in different places, how, you know, how, how do you do anything? Obviously, there was a lot of Zoom theatre at the time, um, but th there were this, these constraints of, of these boxes. People looked like they were all in sort of chicken coops 
groups as they were acting together. So we looked at, at full figure solutions. So what's happening here, uh, we work with 10 theater companies, and what's happening here, all the three, three women are in their separate homes, dancing in real time together, uh, and so on. And these, these guys trying to coordinate their, their activities so that it makes kind of convincing theater all live in real time over the internet. And we created the 3D virtual sets for the theater companies to inhabit. Finally, self. Um, this is a, a, a neural synthes synthesizer developed with um, partners in the uh, University of Western Australia, and that's Darren Moore uh, on, on the drum senior lecturer in, in music, who is the, the big collaborator from, uh, from La Salle. We'll have a look. Self is the world's first neural synthesizer. The neural networks are bioengineered from the project's initiator, Guy Benari's cells. There is no programming or computers involved, only biological matter and analog circuits, a wetalog instrument. The musician and musical instrument become one entity to create a cybernetic musician, a rock star in a petri dish. The sound of the drums was fed as electric stimulations into self's neural network, and self responded by controlling the synthesizers in an improvised post-human sound piece. Okay, so the priority is really in the future is for us to continue with these kind of works, to keep, to take, keep taking them to, to new levels as part of UAS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Uh, well, uh, A very good afternoon to everyone. Um, let me get on with it. Okay, um, I'm very conscious of the time. Um, Ke Moon told us five at most eight. So I actually got my script and I'll, I'll do my best to keep to the time. I just want to start by um, uh, saying again that, you know, NAFA, we are very proud that, you know, after 85 years, right, having been started by our founding principal, Mr. Lim Hak Tai, who came together with a group of arts enthusiasts. And at that time, they came together with a dream, right? A dream to have an art school that combines the uh, best tradition from both worlds, having a curriculum that's balanced between Western and Chinese art traditions. And really, I think 85 years on, we are really very uh, happy and proud that we have stuck through to our mission, our mission of inspiring growth and learning through the arts. So in fact, we do that you know, for students as young as four-year-old to tertiary and beyond, right? Adult learning. So, you know, along with this team today, talking about core priorities, I want to say that really, I think as an arts and, uh, institution, students are always at the center of everything that we do, right? And our main focus lies in providing them with a transformational learning journey to help future-proof all of them for a VUCA world. I know it's a cliche already, right? A VUCA world. But nevertheless, I think this is really what we continue to have to do, right? To help them. And so what are the core priorities that we must continue to focus in arts education? I think just now you've already heard Steve, right, talking a lot about technology. And indeed, I think technology is here to stay, right? We must embrace it and we must really leverage on it. So we ensure that it's already a given, right, that, um, you know, in the institution, we want to make sure our students, right, learn all the new tools, keep up with the technology. But I, I do want to say, however, that, you know, um, while there has been a lot of talk about you know, technology, about AI, we talk about ChatGPT, uh, DALL-E and so on, and always talking about, uh, I think many of us are concerned, right? Whether AI will in the end replace all of us, replace our jobs, right? Will it make artists and designers obsolete? And here I would like to reference um, the rest of my sharing uh, and um, you know, discussion on the work of uh, this uh, computer scientist, an AI expert, uh, Mr. Lee Kai Fu. Right, he has uh, done a lot of work. And one of the things that um, struck me when he shared was that there are really a few things that AI can never replace human, right? And you see on the screen here. And in particular, I bolded a creativity, empathy, as well as dexterity. So for him, he defined creativity as the ability to think across domains, right? to come up with new ideas or solutions 
that are out of the box. So for me, I paraphrase it to creativity through interdisciplinarity. Right? And the second is empathy. That is the human-to-human, -human, unexplainable sense of connection or love. Again, something that a machine cannot do. Third, dexterity, which has to do with the many years of our evolution right, as humankind, and also how we are endowed with our hand-eye coordination. It is about creating phenomenal arts and crafts work that will be making products like the Swiss which, uh, watchmaker type of things that AI cannot do, right? And perhaps humans will continue to treasure handmade products. And if creativity through interdisciplinarity, empathy and dexterity are what machines cannot do, then to future-proof our arts uh, uh, students, our graduates, I think we therefore must continue to strengthen uh, these areas. Interdisciplinarity. Let me go on to this next point. Yep. So at NAFA, we have uh, made interdisciplinarity a core priority and a key feature in all our causes. We have a faculty of interdisciplinary uh, practices to really focus and drive this. Right? So for example, our BA design uh, practice and other programs, it is where students are challenged to collaborate across art forms, domains, and you know, we want them to work on many different things Thereby, you know, when you bring different disciplines and art forms together, that's where creativity right, happens. And we have students who have worked with scientists to develop wearables based on their respiratory technology, just to name an example, right? And they have created installations using printed uh, light technology. And dance and music students, they created collaborative, immersive uh, performances in response to on-site uh, exhibitions and others have designed VR experiences to facilitate the connection of people and recreate the way humans experience food. Our lecturers also lead by example, Iskandar, uh, together with Yongwei, who is also an NUS uh, electrical engineering lecturer, use cutting-edge technology to manipulate the physical property of light and created an installation that produces the past dance, theatre and music uh, images from NAFA's photo archives and also featuring music composition by alumnus and uh, lecturer sound designer, Dane Ng. Just now you have heard um, about Joyce, right? Uh, Joyce Ko, our associate dean, who's invented this uh, um, new instrument. She calls it uh, Konomos, which is a, art, a sound installation and music instrument. So she brought together instrument maker, product designer, and sound engineer to push the boundaries of experimental sound art and contribute to the canon of new interfaces for music expression. So art and design is really integral to making much of science and technology meaningful and accessible to our daily lives. And only human beings can do that through an interdisciplinary approach. Next, I want to quickly jump to the next point, empathy, right? We talked about it just now, that really, I think arts have the ability to connect with our hearts and soul, something that AI cannot replicate. So to future-proof our students, we must continue to pr prioritize helping them develop this very strong sense of empathy for others, and without which we know that they will be no different from machines, right? And certainly then in danger of becoming obsolete in terms of what they do. So we want to tap on the arts to contribute to the care economy, circular economy, what have you, and mobilize it to address rising social challenges. At NAFA, our curriculum nurtures empathetic artists and designers. And we anchor our projects on the community, answer real life challenges, and work with live client projects, where our students empathize with and put the needs of others, right? at the center of their arts in their design. So for example, our BA students in uh, performance making, they did this work called 0 0.01, right? Which explored the relationships that we shared in our busy urban lives and how COVID-19 has changed the way we relate to each other. 
also the collaboration between our fine arts students and the palliative care nurses of Assisi Hospice. Their exhibition uh, aimed to highlight the uh, spotlight, rather, the, the experiences of the nurses and translating them into meaningful artwork. And for a final year project, one of our 3DD landscape and architecture diploma students decided to revitalize a conserved food center. So the student uh, decided to, uh, uh, you know, use, um, or, or rather have this Im Im imagined outcome of a bee sanctuary, right? Quite interesting there. A bee sanctuary that revives the sense of place, right? By involving the community in the process of producing honey. And with global climate change looming over us, the urban space today needs to prioritise not only the aesthetics and the functionality, but also sustainability and adaptability. And our students at the diploma level are already doing that. And we will bring them to the next level with a new bachelor's programme. And this new programme will develop designers who, are, who can create innovative, biophilic, spatial design solutions to bring positive impact on the health and well-being of individuals and communities. Uh, lastly, I want to uh, emphasize again that I think really, I think when we talk about degree, right, it's really only just defining the end of studentship, right, but not necessarily the becoming of a professional. I think in the uh, uh, panel this afternoon, we'll be talking more about that as well. Really, I think learning, we all have been saying it, indeed, it has to be continuous, it has to be lifelong. And really, the last core priority I want to just highlight today is lifelong learning and how we should make it accessible to the wider community. And in NAFA, our Center for Lifelong Education, we have been supporting adult learners over the years. We work with local and uh, overseas universities, arts organizations, many amongst you here, and the industry to live, leverage on each other's strengths. Right? and collaborate between different disciplines to support continuous learning of artists and creatives. And I just want to end uh, with, you, uh, with this quote, leaving you with this quote, that I think indeed the arts education experience serves as a foundation, right? a foundation for our graduates' thinking and a way for them to see and understand the world. The synthesis of knowledge and experience will have to happen within themselves. So for us as arts educators, then I think our role, very important role, is really to facilitate them, facilitate their learning through an interdisciplinary approach for them to help create new value, new meaning to all of us, for all of us, and nurturing in them this very strong sense of empathy, sense of empathy and care for one another, and supporting, of course, their lifelong learning. So with that, I want to thank you. Thank you, Wylan. Uh, so, Mary from the School of the Arts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I have to call you Prof Kwok. <laughs> all right. Um, I think it's really afternoon now. So, good afternoon uh, to all of you and uh, congratulations to UAS. Uh, and thank you for inviting us to be on this panel. Um, I think a lot has been said just by our first two speakers. So, I am thinking I may really not need the eight minutes, and I'll just skip through as much as I can. Um, but I did my homework, uh, as I would expect my students to, so, so I went back to the brief given to us. Um, so the title of the, this panel is Core Priorities in Arts Education Today. And I can't help by, but focus on the word today. And I suppose today simply means uh, versus you know, methods of yesterday, and really we are really preparing students for tomorrow. And then I went on to read the synopsis. I did my homework. And uh, it starts with, in these complex times. And I think a lot has been said about the VUCA world. Uh, I will not go into that, but I really think uh, I would like to outline two core priorities that will help us um, detail the dispositions, the skills, and most importantly, the convictions uh, that we need to instill in our young people so that they can navigate complexity. And the last question on this slide is uh, also found in synopsis, in a crisis-ridden era, how do we define our education mission and public purpose? 
So um, I realize not everybody knows very much about SOTA. I shall start with talking about uh, what the school is all about. So um, School of the Arts Singapore, I think we are neighbors to UAS and good neighbors to NAFA and LaSalle. Uh, we are only uh, MRT right away from you at YST uh, and a plane right to you at Roostum. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, we are very conscious of our neighborhood and our mission. Um, so I would say so basically, we educate students from the age of 13 all the way to 18. They come in at SEC 1. They finish off uh, with the IB uh, DP certification or the IBCP certification at the age of 18. And then they go off to either university or to, uh, or to conservatoires. Um, and therefore, looking at our vision and mission statement, I suppose our public purpose is really not just to turn out artists, visual artists or dancers, but creative citizens for the future. Um, and, um, and our educational aim it re and our mission is really to nurture artistic and creative learners uh, who would positively impact Singapore and the world. So taken together, our vision and mission, I think we are really going... Today, I, I just want to focus my opening remarks on the two dual identities of the students that we are developing. First, the citizen, and secondly, um, the learner. So indulge uh, in me for a while. Um, I want to introduce you to this very important book. Uh, and the, the, the writer of this book is New York Times bestseller uh, of children, children's classic, Margaret Wise Brown. Um, I was inspired by this book to try and describe the SOTA learner. So the most important, it's, and it's written uh, up in, in rather simple, simple language, but not simplistic. And I hope you will... Um, let me read this through to you. The most important thing about the SOTA learner. The most important thing about the SOTA learner is their desire to be creative. In making sense of the world, SOTA learners embrace the notion that learning is creating and creating is learning. SOTA learners display unique cognitive, social, and motivational effective traits. And that's from the work of Gregory Feist, if you want to read up on that. Um, they seek to understand and they seek to be understood. While SOTA learners like to question many things, and on a daily basis, uh, this makes up the bulk of my work, answering their questions. Um, while they like to do that, the inquiry takes them towards sometimes rather inconvenient or untidy rural intersections, which they enjoy and relish. The most important thing about SOTA learners is their desire to be creative. So with this idea of who my students are, uh, I want to talk about two core priorities uh, this morning. The first is this idea of integrative learning. And I think Wailan has spoken about interdisciplinary learning at great length. So, um, and it occurred to me that our concept of integrative learning may not be as embracing or all-embracing as I thought it would be. Uh, so actually, well, so up to this point, integrative learning in SOTA refers to the act of creatively drawing on two or more disciplines in order to better engage with and respond to complexity. Um, but the word disciplines jumps out at me after listening to you, Sola, uh, Wailan. And yeah, I may, I may go back and, and kind of revise this. Um, and this uh, so-called understanding of integrative learning is undergirded by three principles. The first it is grounded in deep disciplinarity. Second, it traverses multi, inter, and transdisciplinarity. And thirdly, it adopts a dispositional view. And it is this dispositional view that I think is something we want to inculcate today of all our learners versus a rather instrumental view of learning of yesterday. And on this rather busy slide, I have a table that systematically kind of contrasts the two. But Let's not go into too much details here, but basically the dispositional view, a learner with a dispositional view is purposeful in his or her learning. There is a sense of agency in deciding what is worth learning, right? This person is pluralistic in his approach, and I can't help but um, turn to Prof Kwok's uh, conclusion of his beautiful and comprehensive keynote uh, this morning. Um, and I thought that keynote, the conclusion of it, uh, totally... Uh, uh, you know, exemplified for us what pluralistic thinking is all about. Um, thirdly, and um, this is what I saw in Steve's uh, presentation uh, just now as well, that element of playfulness, you know, um, and, and joys, you know, working with colleagues um, to, to, to make a new instrument altogether, the, the element of playfulness and this becoming a habit is what we would really like our learners to, to, to embrace and, and, and um, 
and, uh, and be, really. Um, of course, that's contrasted. You know, being playful in one's learning is then contrasted with um, you know, the instrumental view. So if you just look across um, where someone uses disciplinary methods very procedurally, um, or in less kind words, you might say mindlessly, uh, also known as rote learning. All right? So I think the arts offers all of us and our students um, ways and methods to play, and it is this that we need to encourage more. Last but not least, and I hope I have shown you uh, by, by correcting my own definition of integrative learning, is in, in that all understanding needs to be understood to be provisional, in the sense that, uh, you know, including our own understanding, there, there is that fallibility in all understanding, and we need to nurture learners who can then develop the intellectual courage and humility to search for new perspectives rather than just the one right answer. Um, yeah, so that wraps up basically the first core priority uh, that we need, to, we need to teach in our students. This is my last slide and this outlines my second core priority. Uh, and it is this notion of cultural leadership. I suppose in some ways it has to do with this idea of citizenry uh, and this idea of what Minister talked about this morning, how um, the arts has a role to play in building co cohesive societies uh, and defining who we are and all of that. The term cultural leadership uh, is an interesting term. Uh, when we did our research on this, uh, we realized that it's a term that came up uh, primarily in the early 2000s uh, in, the U in the United Kingdom. And it was a response of policymakers really to the dearth of managerial leadership capability uh, of cultural organizations in the UK. Um, so here at SOTA, we have decided to expand on that. Uh, and so we went about trying to read up about this, research about this, and develop our own concept of what this means to our students. So um, very quickly, I have um, five statements to bring you through. So I think first and foremost, Cultural leadership is the act of inspiring others to think, feel, and encounter the world with deeper insight and greater empathy. It involves bridging artistic innovation and excellence in meeting human need. And for that, um, we were inspired by Yo-Yo Ma, the famous cellist work on citizen artists in, in, in and around 2013. The second statement has to, has to do with where cultural leadership is practiced. Well, it is practiced by people at the top of and anywhere else in and outside of organizations, by people with and without appointment, rank, position, or title. The students love this last phrase. They don't like hierarchy, right? And for this, we took a uh, reference from the good work of Sue Hoyle, um, from previously leading the Claw Leadership uh, Foundation uh, in, in the UK. And our third statement has to do with how cultural leadership is different from leadership in other fields, in the sense that it holds the capacity to engage with uncertainty and to express a hold on to ambivalence longer so that a wider range of solutions might be explored. And for this, we refer to the work of Jonathan Price. Um, our fourth statement is about in developing cultural leadership, we are not only developing artists, but also advocates, change makers, social scientists, storytellers, facilitators, community builders, placemakers, and I am going to add in one more, intellectuals, uh, you know, uh, and creatives who through the acts of cultural leadership inspire others to also be creative. Our last statement um, regarding cultural leadership is that it's to do with how it's being taught. It is not really taught. You can't really teach it. There is no syllabus to it. It is hard to say these are the ways, these are the methods, and you go about it. But we can definitely look uh, further into pedagogies that could harness critical dialogue, immersive experiences, and cognitive dissonance in our students. And most importantly, students need the presence of mentors and role models. And I think this morning we just honored so many of you who are practitioners, educators, who have devoted so much of your lives to the whole act of you know, uh, refining your craft and, and uh, your art form, and, and as well as teaching it to the next generation. So, yeah, so that's all. Uh, I have to say these are my two core priorities I wanted to highlight this morning. Uh, yeah, so let's, together, we can, let's be creative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do I have the clicker? And I have, it's the big green button. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. 
for inviting me. Thank you for having me here. And congratulations on the launch of the, of the university. I, I thought it was the launch of the whole thing. It turns out to be the launch of the logo. Um, and <laughs> we, we have been... So I've been around this discussion of the University of the Arts since I arrived in Singapore. So yesterday, preparing the slides, I went online to look for the logo, which is when I realized that it was actually launched today. Uh, but that tells us that the whole idea has been maturing for some time, and, and, and that's it's a good sign. Um, a lot has been said today about artificial intelligence, about the jobs facing us, uh, this seems to be a recurring theme. I will also uh, be presenting some of what, what I perceive to be interesting opportunities, and if not challenges, today. Uh, so let me start with just quoting very briefly from a f an article I read a few days ago on the, in The Economist, uh, which was titled your job is probably safe from artificial intelligence. Probably it was in brackets, <laughs> so this is just in case, because we, no one really knows what's going on. So, But some interesting takeaways from this article is that 5% of the jobs are likely to be unaffected. These are the jobs that are furthest away from the, the uh, economic framework of, of uh, artificial intelligence. About 15% of the jobs will disappear. Or rather, they will be redundant, they will be replaced. This does not mean that unemployment will raise by 15%. And the Economist article was basing this on looking at previous disruptive technologies over the years, over actually the centuries, saying that it does take time, and actually it has a quite small effect in the first 50 years. Fast forward to our age, and we'll say that at least the next generation, we will probably not see a big thing. But 80% of the jobs, which is the rest of us, I hope we're not in the 50, and I think we're not in the 80. We're likely to experience some level of change, some level of change, which means that some parts of our work will be affected by AI. And altogether, if we are not in the 5%, we will all be affected somehow by this. Uh, likely, the definition of the professional in the age of artificial intelligence will be def defined by the ability to harness creativity and innovation across multiple competencies. Emphasizing creativity over compliance, innovation over repetition, embracing the generalist over the specialist, and even the exceptional over the excellent. I think we could add some qualities like curation over production, design thinking, multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, all words that have already been used this morning. And suddenly to me this sounds like a very favorable scenario for the creative industries in general and for arts education in particular. Just have a look at this very recent recruitment campaign from NUS. It's for the NUS Open Days. Uh, these are banners hanging all around campus. I just selected, took a picture of four of them. Students have been asked to present themselves to you know, the new, the prospective students coming into open house. And look at the way they actually present themselves. Programmer, data analyst, and bird watcher. Scholar, engineer, and automotive enthusiast. And that's the picture he chooses to include, is him doing the, 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 the bike. Nurse, health buff, sinophile. Social worker, performer, and backpacker. All of these, 
all of these actually, uh, they choose to present. They choose to present a, a um, their own main interest together with an activity that embraces creativity and the arts. And this is no this is no coincidence by any way. Interestingly, this is something that aligns very well with the strategy of NUS of interdisciplinarity. It actually it's interesting that it, this happens in a university of 40,000 students where only one faculty, and YSD is a tiny faculty, represents the performing arts. But the majority of students embrace creativity as something that actually is part of what they do. And this should be no surprise as NUS and these students, which are essentially the same students the, the, the new University of the Arts also will be dealing with, are situated in a context, the context of Singapore, which traditionally has embraced coexistence and bridging cultural, ethnic, religious differences by sheer geographical and economical necessity. And this is very apparent, especially for one like me coming here only a year ago, it's very apparent in the social fabric, in the financial fabric, in the, in fact, in, in the whole infrastructure of Singapore. It is a very evident trait of this, the success of this country. And it was alluded to by, by the minister this morning. This is less evident in the arts. To be sure, we do have an infrastructure a very vibrant art scene in Singapore, and we do have many great artists. We do have a very generous support for the arts. We do have a quite extensive network of public and institutional donors. And it may not sound or look like that, like ambitious or impressive to you, but believe me, seeing this from the perspective of many developed world, uh, countries in the world, it, there is quite a lot of impressive support for the arts in Singapore. And yet, there are possibilities. There are some signs that this could be different, or should I rather say, some signs that the creative arts are not yet fully embraced in telling the Singapore story. Sometimes this is just down to pure parental pressure, you know, and you know what I'm talking about, is choosing to, to I, think, I think, Mary, you would say that the majority of your students will end up doing a very good education in engineering, medicine, or law, because they're high achievers. And this is not a problem per se, but we need to change the narrative of the arts being not a viable prof professional career. There is also a narrative uh, related to... Yeah, no, I, let, let me stick with that one because that's probably the, the strongest uh, one. There's also a narrative related to how the... The, the official Singapore, and I'm thinking of agencies like uh, the Ministry of Manpower, actually views pursuing a professional career. Are we truly embracing the reality of the creative industries, of the gig economy, which is what a majority of not only our students will be facing, but what the population will be facing, once we look at, assuming that we are in the 80%, assuming what we are going to face moving forward. The launch of this university offers a very great opportunity to change this narrative, to get together and to actually 
develop a new discourse where the arts are perceived as a viable professional choice, where the artist becomes not only the craft and the product, the performance or the exhibition, but actually an agent in the emerging creative industries and the emerging creative industries representing the creative revolution of the rest of the 21st century. What we have experienced in the past months with AI is just the beginning of this. So we stand in front of an opportunity of together changing this narrative. So let's work together to actually give our students access to knowledge across our institutions, across our curricula, across stylistic diversity and across boundaries. Let's work together to unleash the creative potential of Singapore. Congratulations and I look forward to working together with you. Thank you, Peter. Rustum? Yep. I don't have a PowerPoint. Uh, I cannot claim the kind of local knowledge that my colleagues here have demonstrated. I don't live in Singapore. Um, and my thinking about culture is, to be very honest, not framed by the creative industries although I recognize the importance of the creative industries, but I think creativity perhaps has other reference points. So <clears throat> I'd like to begin by thanking Kian Woon for reaching out and inviting me to this inaugural uh, symposium. I think you gave a fantastic uh, uh, keynote speech. It covered very wide ground. And uh, the, I share a lot of affinities with Kian Wun, the deepest being perhaps our veneration and undying respect for, I think, a great visionary from Singapore, and that's Ko Pao Kun. And I do believe that if Pao Kun were alive today, that he would also be supporting this initiative of the University of the Arts, though, in his own way. Now, it's not often that one is invited to reflect on a university of the arts, particularly at a time when the arts and the humanities are being systematically marginalized, if not decimated, by the academic industry in many parts of the world, especially in the UK, where many, many professors are just losing their jobs. Singapore would appear to be different in its support for a new university of the arts, and I think, Peter, you're quite right. Uh, it's quite promising in this moment. So why do we need a, a university of the arts in the first place? This point has been reiterated earlier. At a pragmatic level, one could argue that universities are authorized to grant degrees, unlike conservatories and performing arts institutes, which offer diplomas and certificates. And degrees are useful in today's competitive, job-driven world where universities provide possibilities of employment. And I'm really happy, Kian Wun, that you highlighted livelihood as an important consideration in relation to vocation because we tend to rubbish that a bit and that's, I think, rather, uh, that's a superior attitude because uh, you need livelihood. Without a degree, you can still get a job in a university, but it's likely to be on a temporary or adjunct basis. Now, moving beyond pragmatism, which is, I think, at some level limiting, at a more conceptual level, one could argue that a university of the arts makes a lot of sense in today's world in terms of changing attitudes to the arts. So the earlier divide between those who perform the arts and those who write about and theorize the arts is becoming increasingly more blurred. So today, many contemporary artists, I can think of dancers, I can think of visual artists, who want to be recognized as theorists in their own right, and theorists want to perform their research through new paradigms like performing the archive. So there's a desire at a global level to work across 
the intersections of theory and practice, and I do believe the university is a viable meeting ground. I'd like to make a distinction between a university of the arts and the arts in the university. Now, in my reading, a university of the arts embraces the arts in all their eclectic diversity, ranging from embodied practices to digital and virtual forms of representation. So at a normative level, there is a sense of equity across the arts. But is this an illusion? Are we perhaps not seeing the digital perhaps spearheading the other arts and being the primary mediator? In contrast, the arts in an established academic university compel one to confront the dreaded word, the hierarchy of already existing disciplines from the humanities and the social sciences on which we have not heard very much today apart from passing references in Kian Wun's address. Now this was my experience as a professor of theater and performance studies as yet an emergent discipline in the Indian context at the School of Arts and Aesthetics at JNU, the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, where we in arts and aesthetics, I do believe, we had to prove our academic credentials in relation to the dominant discourses of history, sociology, and the sciences. Now earlier, as a graduate student at the Yale School of Drama, which is a professional school in at Yale University way back in the 1970s, I faced a totally different situation. The school of drama was so autonomous that it had almost nothing to do with the university at all. It was an island unto itself, suffused with its own self-importance. Now, in retrospect, I think this was a wasted opportunity to enlarge the imaginaries of theater in relation to the humanities and the social sciences. Now significantly and ironically, this is what happened at GNU when we found ourselves in productive dialogue with scholars across disciplines. Now today I would argue that any substantial engagement with the arts in a university setting needs a dialogue with other disciplines for a more holistic understanding of what the arts can do in today's increasingly interconnected and ethically embattled world. Now, I realize that such a dialogue cannot be readily assumed, and I think there are logistical issues for this because there's no time for dialogue. So I would suggest that you make time for dialogue, right? And this needs the creation of a new infrastructure based on my own pedagogical interactions in different parts of the world, I'm learning from my colleagues and teachers in the field of arts education of some recurring problems which are likely to be found in Singapore as well. There is, for instance, and I, I discovered this on a recent trip to the US, I find that there's a growing resistance among students of the arts towards the study of history in favor of highly personalized art objects. So there's a lot of passion that goes into doing what I really want to do, right? But sublime indifference when it comes to knowing the evidence that we have across time of many different cultural manifestations. Second, teachers across disciplines are lamenting the fact that their students no longer read. <laughs> their attention spans are severely restricted by their addiction to sound bites and visuals, and Kian Wun pointed this out. The concentration that goes into reading a critical essay from beginning till the end, forget a book, a critical essay will do, but that concentration would seem to be a lost skill. So I think, Kian Wun, you talked about deep reading. You'd, I would also like to add slow reading. This is uh, a construction provided by Gayatri Spivak. Third, one could add the even more substantial lacuna in critical writing. I'm referring here to the necessary task of building an argument and reflecting on the arts, as opposed to opinionating on the arts on Facebook, 
And I think this kind of argument building requires a particular discipline in critical thinking. Thank you. <laughs> now, to deal with these problems, and I've only got a minute or two left, I would suggest that the University of the Arts needs to create interdisciplinary core courses across the arts, but also in relation to other knowledge traditions to enhance conceptual thinking and to work against what I would regard as premature over-specialization of specific skills. It's very difficult, I think it's very non-productive to be too much of a, a success too early. You know, you've got to labor at what you're doing. Second, exploratory writing exercises need to be made mandatory, in my view, on a regular basis as part of a larger training of artistic research. When I teach writing, I always say not more than two pages, please, because we have to read each and every word, right? So if you do more than two pages, we'll never have spare time for our own research. Finally, at a more general level, I'd say that this University of the Arts in Singapore, drawing on Singaporean resources, funding, and modes of expertise, has every right to grant its own degree, which is long overdue. And I would look upon this as a very small step in the larger struggle towards decolonizing the university. <laughs> However, in the commitment towards developing cultural citizenship, which I have listened with great at a national level, hugely necessary, it also needs to open itself to global citizenship at intercultural levels. The university cannot afford to become a cocoon, closing in on itself. It needs to actively nurture its potentiality as a hub, and that is a word that you use, Kian Wun, closing in, uh, uh, sorry, drawing on and feeding cultural and pedagogical resources from other universities, knowledge traditions, and let me add, languages. One of the things I really appreciated in your address today was the fact that you were calling attention to different languages which compelled us to think of different epistemologies of similar concepts, of what appear to be similar concepts. So I think by opening ourselves to these uh, pedagogical resources from other universities, knowledges, and languages in the region and beyond, I think the University of the Arts is a real winner. Thank you. Thank you, Rustam. Um, now, uh, talking about slow reading, we can have slow discussion, but that may mean a very quick lunch. <laughs> so, uh, could I have some idea how much time we have for Q&A? Because I do have a few questions on, on appearing on the, on the iPad. Uh, through Slido. Uh, can somebody tell me how much time we have? Because uh, we won't be unfair, and lunchtime is also a good time for for some interaction. Okay, we've got some. Can we do 10 minutes? And we'll be. Yeah? We'll be very quick and uh, incisive in our responses, right? Now, in, 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 I'm, I'm just going to bunch up a few, few questions, but if there's some really burning issue, because I noticed that Rustam kind of stirred up the crowd with. Dangerous ideas like decolonization and, <laughs> you know, for some reason we don't talk about this enough. Yeah. Uh, and now that the officials are away. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, if anybody has a burning question, please. But I, I see here that there seems to be some interest on the part. There, there must be a few students here who are very concerned. It's almost like asking us, what do you think we should acquire in university education? You, everybody's talking about, talking about complexity, and so I think it's scaring the hell out of them, you know? What, what if, okay, how about this? If you have to name 
one, one, whatever skill, cap cap capacity, capability, each of you, what might that one be? And you have only 20 seconds to say that. <laughs> I'd pass the buck to the organizers and administrators, and I would say make time for critical thinking. Um, I mean, I think what we're trying to instill in students is ambition, vision, um, and, and, and excitement to, to innovate, to do the new, and so on. I see. Yeah, I, I would second that. I would say curiosity is the one word I expect my students to take to heart more than craft or knowledge or anything because the need and especially with the fast changing world the need to be able to reinvent yourself you know five years down the road even probably 40 years down the road it's central so curiosity and being able to learn mm -hmm. thank you peter mary I will use two words, synthetic play. Come, come again? Synthetic play. Syn Being able to synthesize mm -hmm. um, concepts of knowledge across different bodies of knowledge and then play with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mine will be uh, related to learning. I think being open to learning, you know, open to new ideas, mm. always yeah, being curious and learning all the time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I think we've partially answered one, one of the questions, and I think it comes from a young person. But there's another question here, and this, again, very quick answers. Huh? And I know the afternoon we, we can go deeper with, with among our arts educators. The greatest challenge in arts education today, name one, because if we can all agree on that one, we'll go after that one. Funding, <laughs> sufficient <laughs> funding. Okay. Yeah, actually, I second that, <laughs> funding. You presidents, you're not poor. <laughs> okay, Mary? Time. I, I can't run away, but you know, from that very practical concern about time, our students are terribly busy today. Uh, we need to declutter their, their will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Peter? No, I agree fully. This, is, this is, happens to be a particular Singaporean issue, you know. <laughs> uh, I must say, compared to the rest of the many other similar places in the world, you do put your students through a very hard academic, rigorous thing, and there seems to be a one preferred path. And the reality is that we don't know. And the, you know, students coming into you get them at one thirteen. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I have, I have two sons. They had no idea of anything when they were thirteen, and and they have become something completely different than what I thought, what they thought, mm -hmm. because we have given them the opportunities, and I think this is a big issue. So making time, but also making the connections across outside of the silos of the different schools and the different you know, activities they, be, they belong to. I, I think that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Rustam? Thank you. You've expressed that very, very precisely and beautifully. Um, I would like us to not be so persecuted by this pursuit of perfection and to develop a respect for imperfection, and to find the courage to fail. So, um, I, I, I see that we have addressed quite a few, but I can just, is there some burning question out there which you want to shout out, please? Don't be shy, artists are supposed to be courageous. Something which somehow we've been missing is a kind of blind spot um, by the leaders of educational institutions. Yes, please. Yeah. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, Peter, please. Uh, thank you, Robin. This is this is absolutely central. And again, saying looking at Singapore from the perspective of the world, much good is going on here because you have, we are already a melting pot. So the idea of coexistence is much more lively and embodied here than elsewhere. I would nevertheless say that you're absolutely on the money in terms of what makes the arts different and we need to be international. And in my interactions with Singaporean authorities, I keep repeating this, that you cannot have an interna uh, uh, you cannot have a world world class arts education if it is not international. And being international means that Singaporean talents need to be exposed to their peers internationally by exchange opportunities, but also by having internationalizations at home. It means that we need to embrace international students as part of the creative industry, because the creative industries are international by definition. So languages as, an, as one expression of internationalization, absolutely correct. Thank you. And there was another history. How important is history? I mean, I mean, I, uh, I, I think in terms in terms of uh, of history, we we do try, um, and and we we have historical and contextual studies across all, all our programs, and we we are always in, in, encouraging a real understanding of the history. It, it may be it isn't kind of the broadest history, and maybe it, it could be broader. It is very very specific to their discipline, and you know, key practitioners, and you know, and and his historical tra uh, trajectories, so that the students really understand what came before and and, and their their place in it so it is something you know we, we try to do all all the all the time all the time mm -hmm. i would s simply add to that that uh, our onus as teachers is to find new ways of teaching history you know our, our methods of teaching history i fear are a little fossilized you know a little too you know reductive uh, we need more visual inputs and whatever interdisciplinary inputs in in, in the teaching of history um, and maybe that is just not happening enough, you know. Thank you. Now, I'm... Uh, yes? I, I only what? just want to quickly add that I think it is occasions such as this where we have a chance to talk, you know, and engage with uh, so many different uh, educators. And I think amongst the audience, we have uh, people who are teaching the younger students because I think it is not like we exist alone and it is just them learning more about history when they're in universities. I think that is important. But equally important is all the um, you know, learning and the, the teaching uh, from a very young age. And I think we can continue to work together you know, on uh, such matters. Yeah. And the sense of history and you know, the, um, the, 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 the sense of uh, being part of something larger than themselves. I think it's what something that we always emphasize, you know, when we come uh, into the institution like at NAFA. So it's not really just about, you know, a, a particular course or module per se. It is that overall sense of being, yeah, that we continue to, you know, nurture and emphasize. And I think in terms of history, I just want to add on the integrative uh, aspect of learning that within the art form, I think, Wailan, you alluded to that in your presentation where it is the integration of, you know, not just the digital, but not just the contemporary, but also with traditions. And I think for a young country like Singapore, we need to imbue in our young students the sense of tradition, which, um, you know, because on their feeds, on their social media feeds, and, and their whole life is so digitized. But, you know, giving them that exposure to, to the traditions that we have is invaluable. All right, I, I, I'm a little mindful of the time because uh, we want to have some slow eating and deep eating. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you have to put any of our speakers on the spot for one thing, what might that be? And Torture. Uh, yes, Sassy, I can depend on you. Uh. Uh, I don't have a mic, so I'll just speak. Um, the whole discussion this morning and uh, what we've heard from the floor uh, has been wonderful in terms of uh, uh, the, the arts uh, going into the university, whether it's about the university of the arts or the arts in the university. But the obverse of that is that 
to ask the question whether the arts should be in the university at all. Uh, I think that there, there needs to be uh, a commitment to understanding what the needs of the arts are in the first place, what the needs of practice is in the first place, and what the needs of the arts in the context of Singapore is today. I think these are fundamental questions uh, which we need to ask, uh, which I fear we have preconceptions of, which can be questioned and which can be countered, which are not achieved, which do not achieve a sufficient airtime yeah, in a gathering like this. Uh, and I speak specifically uh, of the fact that I'd like to know how many artists were consulted when it came to the, the, the composition of the University of the Arts. How many people working on the field in the practice were asked about what the issues were to make art, to be creative, to inspire. How many of these people were engaged? And I fear I don't know the answers to those questions. And I think that therein lies the problem. Thank you, Sassi. Thank, thank you. Sasi, uh, thank you. I, I think we value that kind of candor because many of these discussions, you know, there are some buzzwords. Uh, collaboration is a buzzword. Interdisciplinarity is a buzzword and it has got eight syllables in it. And, uh, we, but uh, I, Sasi, you, you will be a speaker this afternoon. In, uh, and I want you to, to bring it all out and put it on the table. Yeah? Uh, because uh, to even think about the, the questions you've asked uh, would mean that uh, we don't have lunch. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't, don't mean to make light of this, but... Uh... <laughs> okay, yeah. Because of vocation rather than livelihood, right? Yeah. All right, I, I think, yes, we couldn't have gotten away from this session without some real difficult challenges and and this is why I would encourage all to have a good lunch but make sure you come back because the afternoon panel you know we just kind of like lay the groundwork for them to answer the questions you know yeah so uh, organizers can I call call for a break and that we all have a good lunch and do some good networking and come back at what time 1 45 because there will be a performance before we start yeah. Thank you, everybody, and thanks to our panelists. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you.